Welcome to NAAP's Solution Series program titled, Is an Upright Right for You? My name is Sandy Hudson, and I will be your host. The Solution Series programs are available at no cost to NAAP members. These mini-webinars run less than 30 minutes, and the goal of each program is to provide you with some quick tips and insights, all types of positive strategies and tactics to help you succeed in today's tough business environment. We encourage you to drive the content. Please send us an email to solutions at naap.org to let us know what topics and presenters you would like to hear from in future programs. Please advance to the next slide. NAAP has produced the popular Solution Series programs for two years. Did you miss one of our informative topics? The archives of these programs are available to NAAP members at no cost through the on-demand bookstore. Examples of past programs are listed on the current slide. Our topics cover finance, niche development, retail topics, and more. Visit the NAOP website at www.naop.org backslash solution series for links to the archives. Please advance to the next slide. And now let's get on with our program. With us today is Richard Murphy, Managing Director at Caltan Asset Management. Rich began his career in public accounting at ENY Kenneth Leventhal, Ernst & Young LLP, serving commercial real estate clients with tax planning and compliance services. His clients included a broad range of companies that included some of the nation's largest REITs, as well as merchant developers and regional construction companies. He also worked for Eckridge Real Estate Services, where he served as the assistant for immediately prior to his principal role at West Park Real Estate Advisors. There he provided clients with underwriting, consulting, and asset management services, amongst other things. Rich is also an honorably discharged veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps. Welcome, Rich. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks a lot, Sandy, and uh, very excited to uh, be here today talking about upreads and upread contributions uh, specifically. Um, just to get started, we'll kind of walk through the agenda for the day. Um, first, we'll do a little bit of introduction and background to REITs and kind of the concept. Um, we'll then walk through the upread contribution mechanics of kind of how that transaction occurs and what it looks like. Uh, we'll talk about tax consequences. Um, how it can compare to a 1031, and then what are some pros and cons and advantages and disadvantages of the strategy. And just to kind of start out, um, to kind of describe, I guess, you know, who this sort of strategy could apply to, it could, you know, certainly on the one hand apply to, um, you know, any tax-motivated investor or property owner. Um, as a practical matter, though, there's kind of a... Um, a, a size need to have kind of a critical mass to be able to do one of these transactions and it's probably in the $10 million size. So again, any kind of a tax motivated investor who's got, you know, $10 million more of property um, is certainly someone who could do this. But I think if you look at, you know, who are the people that this would, this is really kind of a good idea for, it's really kind of people who fall into kind of one or two categories. Um, you've either got potentially large single asset owners so, for example, uh, think of maybe a family trust or someone who's maybe inherited a large piece of real estate, and this is the only piece of real estate in their, um, in their portfolio, and so they've got kind of all of their risk concentrated in that one asset. Um, well, by doing this transaction and effectively, um, you know, giving the property to a REIT and taking back an ownership in the REIT, um, you can effectively diversify um, your risk pretty considerably. Um, another group of folks who would probably be pretty interested in this sort of a technique might be portfolio owners or, again, single asset owners, but people who are fundamentally looking to kind of escape the management responsibilities associated with property ownership. Again, maybe they're not real estate professionals. They uh, acquired this real estate through some sort of other, through, through some sort of kind of non-traditional means. Um, and, uh, again, they're either not in a position to manage it or they just don't want to manage it. And again, they can achieve, uh, you know, by, again, giving the property to the REIT and taking back ownership shares, they can effectively hire the REIT, if you will, to kind of manage the property for them. So again, that's kind of the universe of people who would probably um, uh, be interested in this kind of a concept. Again, kind of a little bit of an introduction and a background to what are REITs. Uh, most people probably understand kind of intuitively on some level what REITs are. Um, they're really... Um, on some level, just kind of mutual funds um, that own real estate instead of stocks. Um, and that, that's a pretty good description of what they are. As a matter of fact, a lot of the uh, tax technical rules that they have to follow 
uh, mirror that of RICs, which are regulated investment companies, which are, you know, said differently, mutual funds. So they share a lot of the same rules. Um, one of the, probably the most, um, you, you know, um, unique feature of REITs and mutual funds, for that matter, is the is how they're taxed. Effectively, um, REITs, so long as they distribute all of their cash, um, uh, all of their income in the form of a dividend, um, they're able to take that dividend as a deduction and they don't have to pay any income tax. Mutual funds work effectively the same way. Um, as a result of this, REITs kind of take on to a large extent kind of uh, what partnerships do, um, except they have a corporate structure. So they have a corporate structure, but they avoid that second level of tax by effectively being able to, again, with the, assuming they distribute out all of their income in the form of a dividend, um, they don't have to pay any tax. Um, as a practical matter, um, you'll find that most REITs will usually kind of over-distribute their income. So not only will they distribute all of their income, they'll distribute out 105, 110 percent of it, something along those lines. So you wind up with not just um, a dividend payment, but usually wind up with some sort of a return of capital as well. So that's kind of what REITs are. In terms of the different types of REITs out there, they come in several different flavors. Um, up REITs, down REITs, uh, mortgage REITs, uh, hybrid REITs. Um, we're going to focus today on the up REIT structure. And really what the up REIT structure is, is if you can visualize, um, you have a REIT, but instead of the REIT actually owning property, what the REIT does is it owns an interest in a partnership. And that partnership we call the operating partnership, or uh, for shorthand, just the OP. So the OP, <coughs> excuse me, or the partnership underneath the corporation is what owns all of the property. And because it's a partnership, this is the mechanism that allows us to be able to contribute our property into the partnership and take back an ownership share on a tax deferred basis. Um, again, up REITs exist uh, almost exclusively to allow people to basically do this. So the concept here is I own a property, um, I contribute this property into the partnership and in return I receive an interest in the partnership. In and of itself, this is a non-taxable event. So it's kind of a very similar sort of an outcome to a 1031 in that sense. Um, what I get back um, for my property contribution is units or, again, ownership in that operating partnership. And as a practical matter, as you can imagine, that to some extent it dilutes the REIT ownership. Um, now there's, instead of being just one owner of this OP, there's now two, um, and, so on and so on and so forth. However, it's more than just a tax play. Um, because there's no sort of a taxable event that occurs when we contribute our property to the uh, to the operating partnership, I can own that operating partnership um, units for a significant period of time, and I can uh, I can look at the uh, the underlying value of the stock and the REIT to which there's usually a one to one correlation between uh, units and the operating partnership and shares in the REIT, meaning that I can transfer, they're, they're, they're totally transferable one-to-one. -one. And when I feel as though the time is right, um, I could go ahead and I can then transfer my units into shares um, of, uh, of REIT stock and I can go out and sell that stock and I can monetize my investment. Um, it's not until I actually do that act of exchanging the uh, units for shares that I actually have any kind of a taxable event. So I can, again, I can contribute my property into the operating partnership and I can hold my interest in that operating partnership for years. And I will continue to receive an allocation of income, uh, you know, distribution, uh, you know, cash distributions, probably in much the same way I did uh, previously when I just owned the property itself. So again, you have the ability to not just defer your, your gain, but there's also the potential to, um, uh, for some more upside. Uh, there's also the potential for downside, too. Stock can certainly go up or down. Um, but again, it's more than just a bit of a tax play. OK, so the so kind of the, the mechanics of this transaction. Um, again, we introduced the concept of the operating partnership. And again, the notion that um, I'm taking my property uh, and I'm giving it to this operating partnership, and I'm receiving units in return. And if you think about how that transaction would be done, you know, how do you value you know, the units in this operating partnership? 
Well, because of the fact that in just about all cases, there's a one-to-one -one equivalency um, between uh, OP units and shares of stock in the, in the REIT itself, um, you can negotiate a price. You know, it, just as an example, let's say we have a property that we're valuing at a million dollars. And currently, the stock of the REIT is trading at you know, $10 a share. Well, that would have an equivalent of about 100,000 units in the operating partnership. So again, the transaction there would be negotiated in the form of, well, I'm going to give you the property, and I'm going to receive back 100,000 units um, in the operating partnership. So that's kind of how the transaction would look itself. One of the unique aspects of this sort of a transaction, though, is, is if you think about it, and it may seem somewhat counterintuitive, but because there's really no cash trading hands here, essentially you're just you're, you're giving up a deed and you're receiving um, you know, uh, partnership units and, you know, in return. There's really no cash changing hands. So as a practical matter, the, whatever the costs associated with this transaction are, um, you know, everyone's going to have to pay those themselves. And, uh, you know, as a seller who normally would be coming away from the closing table with a, you know, with a check in their hand, they may actually have to bring a check to the closing table. Um, that being said, though, the transaction costs should be certainly no greater than they would be with a normal, you know, uh, fee simple, you know, uh, transaction. So it's not that the, the transaction costs are really significantly more or less. Um, but it's just this notion that, again, as a seller, I may be actually bringing a check to the closing table, and that's uh, perhaps maybe more of a psychological barrier than anything else. Um, uh, but again, kind of a unique feature of this sort of a, of, of a transaction. Okay, so tax consequences. And, you know, as a practical matter, I think most people are going to be tax-driven who, um, who are looking at doing these sorts of uh, transactions. And again, you know, you have a non-recognition upon contribution. So again, putting the property into the REIT in and of itself is a non-taxable event. Um, that really, <coughs> really nothing is triggered by that event in and of itself. And incidentally, Section 721 of the Code is what describes this sort of a transaction. Um, and, and again, this concept applies even kind of outside of the REIT world. Um, you know, if there's any sort of a partnership where one person contributes property to that partnership, um, again, there's no gain uh, associated with that uh, contribution. So this kind of even exists kind of outside of the real world in that sense. Um, one of the big things I think that people need to realize is that, um, and I, I mentioned it on a, on a subsequent slide, is that just because you're contributing your property to this partnership, you take back units, you could hold those units for several years and then later on exchange them for shares and not recognize gain until that point. One of the key things to remember here is that nothing about the character of the gain or loss that you're going to recognize um, changes. And so one of the big things that a lot of people, I think, probably miss when they're doing tax planning and what have you is um, how unrecaptured Section 1250 gain can impact their transaction. And unrecaptured Section 1250 gain is really just kind of a fancy way of saying depreciation recapture. Okay. Um, if I've owned a property for a period of time and I've depreciated it, when I sell that property, to the extent uh, the the gain on that transaction is going to be recognized that you know to the extent that I have taken depreciation expense, the depreciation portion of whatever the gain is is going to be taxed at a different rate than the leftover piece. Um, we all think of uh, capital gains as being say 15 percent, at least that's what they are today. Um, but the piece associated with your uh, depreciation expense is taxed at 25%. So again, it's a very important um, consideration. Uh, and the other just piece that I would add on to that as well is that <coughs> the depreciation expense is going to be continues to be allocated to you after you've, after you've contributed your property. So again, I contribute my property into the operating partnership. I take back units and I'm now going to have an, in, an income allocation. And there's a very complex way that depreciation winds up being allocated in this scenario. But the bottom line is, once you contribute your property, um, the clock doesn't stop. And you don't stop being allocated depreciation expense. And you don't stop having your basis being adjusted. Um, you know, your basis uh, is going to go up by income that you're allocated. And it's going to go down by distributions that you take out. 
it's going to have the exact same you know uh, character and the, the the same thing is going to be happening um, with your ownership of the OP units as it would have if you just own the property. So that it's not like there's some sort of a you know a, of a switch that we throw and there's magically all of this stuff goes away. You have exactly the same um, you know character of the gain uh, regardless. Um, and then again, just again to to reinforce the notion that again the gain or the taxable event occurs when we convert the units um, into stock um, and of notably not when you sell the stock. Okay, so that's an important point. Um, I think conceptually and as a, you know, kind of as in, in, in actual practice, when most people can be, convert their units to stock, they do so um, and then they sell the stock basically immediately. But you don't have to. And again, the point I'm trying to make there is, is that the gain occurs when you convert the units into stock, not when you sell the stock. And that's, um, that's an important uh, an important distinction to make. Again, as we mentioned, uh, units are typically one-to-one -one equivalent uh, of shares. And again, that's just to kind of make life easy. The only reason I throw that out there kind of again is because uh, I mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation, there is something called, um, there's, there's upreads, which is what we're talking about. But there's also down reads. And really the only difference between an up read and a down read is, uh, again, conceptually, the up read, you have a, a, a read, a corporation, which owns an interest in a partnership. The partnership owns all the property. Well, with the down read, you have a situation where you've got the REIT, which owns an interest in the partnership, which owns property. But the REIT itself can also own property. So if you think about it, under that sort of a scenario, your ownership in the OP uh, would not be inclusive, uh, uh, would not have, would not be inclusive of an interest in necessarily all of the property. So that's the only reason why I mention it. But again, kind of sticking with kind of a, a, a purist concept here of the upreed, uh, again, it's, it's, it's a kind of a one-to-one -one concept. 1031 comparison. This is kind of a, a question that's, or, or you know, a, a kind of an analogous transaction that, that's often kind of compared to this. And there are similarities, but there's also some differences. Probably the biggest similarity is the deferral of the gain. So again, um, with a 1031 exchange, I get to sell a property and then exchange it for another property and I get to defer my gain. In this case, I'm, uh, for all intents and purposes, selling my property and I'm receiving units uh, uh, in an investment in, re in, in return. But again, there's no, there's no actual gain on that transaction itself. Um, I would argue that um, one of the differences is that uh, an upread contribution really kind of allows for a true out, if you will. Um, in other words, you can do what we call swap it until you drop in, which is you can 1031 and 1031 and 1031 uh, effectively until the you know principal owner of that property dies um, and then their heirs will receive a step up and that's kind of you know their way out but um, the reality is, is that you have to stay in real estate for a long time um, with this it kind of lets you out of real estate um, to it to an extent uh, in that you're trading your real estate in for an uh, for an just an investment in real estate um, and you can, you know, again, trade out of the actual hard property itself, and again, get away from some of the, um, you know, you know, the, the management responsibilities that you would otherwise have and whatnot. And again, it gives you the same, uh, you know, effect of tax deferral. Um, another one of the key differences here is there's no rigid timing rules. Anyone who's ever done a 1031 exchange um, is probably intimately familiar with the 45-day identification period. And then the 180-day, um, you know, total period that you have to get the transaction done, and some of the other rules associated with how many properties you can identify of what value, etc. There's no sorts of rules. There's no. There's no real rigid rules associated with this sort of a deal. You decide to do it when you decide to do it, and then you decide when you want to exchange your units for shares. Uh, completely up to you. There's no, um, there, there's really no rigid um, timing rules or any, any other real rigid sort of structure associated with it. It's more driven by um, you do it when you want to do it. Um, again, as I mentioned before, with respect to the 1250 recapture, the eventual gain recognition is identical. So again, um, by entering into this up retransaction, um, we're not doing anything to change the character 
uh, of the game that we that, that we're going to be recognized, and it's not like we you know anything gets uh, it's not like we get to you know wipe away the depreciation or anything like that. Um, and then lastly, again, there's the ability to kind of choose the timing of your gain. Um, if you're going to sell a property, you know there's some inherent inherent illiquidity associated with it. So if I decide today, <coughs> excuse me, that I want to sell a property, it may be six months or more before I can monetize that. Um, whereas uh, with most REITs, it's usually a function of if I, if I tell the REIT I want to exchange my units for shares, <coughs> excuse me, it's usually a matter of either days or weeks before I can effectuate that transaction. So it's much, much more liquid. Pros and cons, um, again, we kind of talked a little bit about this already, but there's the potential for upside and downside. Again, uh, back to my kind of million dollar property example where, you know, we negotiated 100,000 units at, you know, $10 a share. Well, I mean, if those shares went from, say, $10 to $15, we'd have, you know, an extra, you know, we'd have another 50%, you know, gain. Um, but at the same time, those shares could go from $10 to $5. So there's both uh, the potential for both upside and downside. Um, and then you also have to include, um, you know, during your holding period, you're also going to still have income allocations and cash distributions made to you as well. So again, there's the potential for some upside and downside that you don't have necessarily with the 1031 exchange. Uh, again, back to the notion of liquidity. Um, inherently, uh, this is a much more liquid sort of a investment than actual hard real estate itself. Um, again, you know, you're looking at probably a six-month window um, before you can monetize any sort of a real estate asset. Whereas, uh, again, with uh, some of these units, it can be done in you know days or weeks. Diversification. I can. This goes back to kind of the notion of, you know, if I'm one of these, you know, kind of one property owners, um, and I have all of my risk concentrated, all of my real estate risk anyway, concentrated in that one asset. Um, you know, this is a potentially a mechanism for me to be able to contribute that property in and now have an interest in, you know, dozens or hundreds of properties. Um, and I get, you know, whatever the value of my property was for that. So again, it's an effective way to kind of diversify, and, you know, out of uh, highly concentrated risk positions. And then kind of the last point I'll leave, I'll leave with you here, and to some extent this may contradict some of the other things that I've been saying, but I think it's important to remember that um, when you own a stock, it's a stock. It's not real estate. And I, I, I mention this because I think there's a lot of people who um, use REITs as a mechanism to expose their portfolios to real estate. And as a practical matter, if you look at you know most REIT stocks, they correlate much more closely with you know the S and P 500 than they do you know really anything else. Um, and so again, it's important to note that their stocks and they're going to move like stocks, um, and they're going to have the volatility of stocks. And so in that sense, um, you know, a REIT investment is not a pure real estate play. And I think that's um, just kind of important to mention. That being said, I know we kind of went through that quickly and uh, probably, you know, at kind of a fairly high level. So to the extent that anybody, you know, has any questions or would like to kind of delve further into this, um, please feel free to uh, send me an email here at rmurphy at calcane.com. And uh, again, I want to thank uh, Sandy and Nap for giving us the opportunity to uh, give this presentation. Rich, thanks for a great presentation and giving our members an overview of our briefs and how they work. Our next solution series program will be available on June 21st. Watch your email for NAB source or corporate e-newsletter for the program link. Thank you for listening to our session and goodbye for now. <laughs>